My name is Joe Pollack from Penn State University, and here I'm uh, going to tell you a little bit about some of the preliminary results from the Global Coral Microbiome Project. This is a collaborative NSF-funded project between Becky Vega Thurber's lab at Oregon State University and Monica Medina's lab at Penn State University. And what we're setting out to do is to describe microbial diversity across all major groups of reef building corals globally. It's not no big deal. No, it's kind of a big project. So to date, we've collected over 1,800 samples from 70 coral genera spanning 10 different countries. Today, I'm gonna to be telling you about a subset of those, those samples that were collected from all around Australia. So we'll be talking a lot at the micro scale, but I just wanted to start out by talking at a macroscopic scale. So anybody who's ever been uh, diving on a reef will recognize that coral reefs are actually uh, comprised of discrete ecological zones that each, that are, each are hosting discrete communities of organisms. So as we go for a dive, we might start out in the water column. We're gonna notice some fishes. We might have a chance to see some sharks. As we get down to the benthic substrate, we're gonna see some anemones, maybe some corals, potentially some algae. And if we start to dig around in the substrate, we're gonna see some crustaceans and a huge number of different kinds of worms. So if we take those ideas and we zoom in 10,000 times to the scale of an individual coral polyp, we see a very similar sort of situation where we've got a coral mucus layer that's gonna potentially host its own community. We've got a coral, uh, yeah, that doesn't work really well. We've got uh, the coral tissue as well as the coral skeleton. So uh, it would make sense that these different zones would host different communities of microbes. But traditionally, the techniques that have been used to sample and to study coral microbiomes have compressed all of these different zones and all of the microbial diversity that they host into a single extraction or a single sample. So without knowing where these guys are living, it's very hard to understand what their ecology is, what their function is. This is not too dissimilar to very early studies of potentially fish. I found this archival footage from Jacques Cousteau, where we might be studying uh, what fish are on a reef through a fairly delicate technique known as, uh, as dynamite fishing. <laughs> right, it's a pretty awesome video, you should check this out. So just as it might be difficult for these guys to recreate the ecology and to understand the ecology and the function of these different fish routes without knowing where they live, very similarly, by compressing all of those distinct zones into one sample in a coral, we're missing a great deal of information about what's actually going on. So that kind of leads us to our first objective, which is to understand the, the, function, the structure of microbial communities across compartments within a coral polyp. We'll then have a look at the role of coral taxonomy and coral phylogeny in structuring coral microbiome communities. And we'll end by having a look at the role of geography, again, in structuring these communities. So for, the, for that first objective, to look at the coral compartments, we break it into three distinct zones. So we've got the coral mucus layer, which you can see there in green, the tissue in brown and the skeleton in purple. I'll keep that color scheme throughout, the, throughout this study, so keep that in mind. Um, so to separate those into those different compartments, first when we go down, we're gonna use a sterile syringe. You can see Becky sampling some coral mucus layer with a sterile syringe. We'll then break off a coral fragment or take a biopsy to give us the tissue and the skeleton. We'll then use air blasting to separate the tissue from the underlying skeleton and then we'll be left with a tissue-free skeleton compartment. Crush that up, we've got our three different components there. Okay, so that's the coral, component, co coral compartments idea. The next thing we wanna know about is what is the role of coral taxonomy and the role of coral phylogeny in shaping these microbiome communities. So as you guys may be aware, over more than 200 million years of evolutionary history, scleractinian corals have diverged into 21 diverse clades that are comprised of hundreds of individual species that each have their own life history strategies and ecological niches. Now historically, a lot of microbiome studies will look at one species, maybe a couple of species across that phylogenetic tree. Uh, as I mentioned in this Global Coral Microbiome Project, we're looking at uh, the better part of 70 of those. In this study, we're gonna be talking about 35 scleractinian genera and five outgroup anthozoa genera. 
So that's uh, look, having a look at coral taxonomy and phylogeny, but we also want to know what's the role of geography and what's the role of environment in structuring these microbial communities. So to address that question, we sampled from reefs all around Australia. We collected samples from Western Australia at Ningaloo Reef, as well as a latitudinal uh, gradient spanning from Lizard Island in the north to the central sector of the Great Barrier Reef, all the way down to Lord Howe Island, which is the world's most southern uh, coral reef. This spanned a 17 degrees of latitude. Uh, in order to get an idea of seasonality, we also sampled corals from Lizard Island and from the central sector, both in the summer and the winter. Cool, so this is just a summary of what we ended up with. We ended up with uh, about nine, 689 samples across those different compartments, as well as some outgroups and some sediment and water. We amplified the 16S ribosomal RNA gene of the bacteria uh, in the V4 region, and after quality control, we ended up with over 10 million bacterial reads that averaged out to more than 16,000 reads per sample. Cool, so let's have a look at our first question, this, this question of uh, do we find distinct communities in these coral compartments? So to address that question, we're gonna have a look yeah, this really does. Oh, there we go. Okay, cool. At a principal components analysis, so you guys are probably familiar with these. Basically, the microbial community of one individual sample is going to be represented as one dot here. The closer together two dots are, the more similar their communities are. Um, this is all of our sclerectinian corals that I'm showing you here. And what we can see just visually is that there's pretty good separation between the mucus, the tissue, and the skeleton compartments. That's supported uh, very well statistically, both overall and in a pairwise manner. So we are seeing different microbial communities here. And just on this axis, we're seeing good separation along the second principal components axis. So we're seeing differences in overall community structure. We're also seeing differences in bacterial richness. So we see the greatest amount of alpha diversity or species richness in the coral skeleton, less in the coral mucus, and, uh, sorry, less in the tissue, and even less in the mucus. So this is kind of cool. This tells us that our fairly straightforward approach to compartment separation is effective, and that we're finding different communities in these different compartments. But what I actually find more interesting is that we see different responses to both host and environmental factors depending on which compartment we're looking at. So in this figure, I'm gonna show you a comparison on our x-axis. We've got colony size as the percentage of the maximum size for that species either recorded in our study or that we could find in the literature. And on the y-axis, we've got alpha diversity or again, species richness. So interestingly, what we can see is a very strong trend of, of uh, decreasing alpha diversity as the corals get larger, presumably as they're aging. This, this vibes pretty well with some things we've seen in the symbiodinium literature, as well as in other microbiome studies where it looks like these guys are taking up a diverse array of microbes when they're young or when they're small, and we're getting some winnowing uh, as we're growing older or presumably uh, growing larger. Interestingly, we see that trend um, very strong in the tissue and in, it's not working, very strongly in the tissue and in the skeleton, but we don't see any trend at all in the mucus. On the other hand, if we have a look at the impact of seasonality, we see that um, a great amount of uh, our microbial variation is explained by seasonality in the mucus compartment, and less so, we see less of a, a, an impact of seasonality on the tissue and on the skeleton. So that makes sense. The mucus is gonna be what's in the most intimate contact with the overlying surface water. Okay, so sort of in summary, we see differences in bacterial community composition and richness between compartments. And we see that the microbial communities in these compartments are responding differently to both host and to environmental factors. So that's the, that's the things that's driving microbial communities across an individual coral polyp. Let's look at some things that may be driving uh, bacterial community structure across coral taxonomy and phylogeny. So the first thing that we see here is that coral host genus gives us a lot of information about our bacterial community structure. We see a large role of, we see that coral genus explains a lot of the variation in all of our compartments, but that it explains a great deal of uh, community variation within our tissue compartments. Again, that makes a lot of sense. Those microbes within the tissue compartment are gonna be the most closely associated with the host tissues, so it's not at all surprising. 
Um, but this does lead us to think, so if we're seeing strong correlations between host genus and microbiome community composition, that then leads us to ask some questions about, could it be that parameters of that microbiome could be following trends of coral phylogeny? So as these corals have diverged over evolutionary time, are we seeing any evidence that the microbial community composition or really any aspect of that microbiome could be following similar trends uh, as these corals are diverging? So to start to answer that question, Jesse Zaneveld, who's the postdoc in uh, Becky Vega Thurber's lab at Oregon State University, has been using ancestral state reconstruction to start to map some parameters of the microbiome onto coral phylogenies um, to help us to visualize this question of do they follow phylogenetic patterns. So when we map on alpha diversity, or again, species richness, uh, while we do see some trends uh, within individual genera, so we see these acroporis tend to be similar. We see some similarities down here in, in some of these pocilloporids. We don't see any, it doesn't look like there's a clear trend that it's following phylogeny as a whole. But when we consider not coral phylogeny, but rather coral life history, we start to get some interesting insights. So this is some work that was done by uh, Darling et al. in 2013, where they broke individual coral species into different kinds of functional groups. So they, they broke them into competitive, stress tolerant, weedy, and generalist, based on a number of different life history parameters, including things like reproductive mode, uh, growth rates, competition. Now when we put that information onto this tree with our alpha diversity, we see that groups that are separated very distantly phylogenetically, but that share similar parameters in their life history strategies, we see some potential convergence of aspects of their microbial communities, not so much driven by phylogeny, but rather driven by life history traits. This is something we're looking into a fair bit more at the moment, but to me it's pretty interesting. So we see that host genus explains a great deal of information about the microbiome composition and that life history may be a better predictor of composition than phylogeny. I'm running a little short on time, so I just want to show you guys one interesting result from our geography aspect of this work. So some of you guys may, for, may be familiar with a, a thing called the latitudinal diversity hypothesis. So this is this observation, is a hypothesis developed to explain observations of macroscopic uh, land animals originally, where we see decreasing diversity as we move from the equator towards the poles. So using this data set where we've got 17 degrees of latitude gives us a really good opportunity to uh, explore that question on the microbial level. And what we find is in fact as we move from the equator towards the, towards the poles that we do see this trend of decreasing species uh, bacterial species diversity that's again going to be manifested across all of our coral compartments. So we've seen a great deal of, of sort of results here about different things that are driving overall community composition, but you might be asking yourself, well, that tells us a lot about composition, but it doesn't tell us that much about function. It doesn't tell us what they're doing. So this stuff that I've presented to you is just a small subset of one of the prongs of this Global Coral Microbiome Project. We're also sequencing a number of coral-associated bacteria for genome sequencing uh, in collaboration with the Earth Microbiome Project. We're doing metagenomics and metabolomics on a subset of these samples. And we've also been using uh, genome and transcriptome information from the host, Symbiodinium, and the bacteria to start to reconstruct some metabolic uh, maps. And interestingly, what we're seeing is a great deal of metabolic complementarity between the coral host, the symbiodinium, and the microbial communities that I'm really interested to look more into as this project evolves. The final point I want to make is that uh, this Global Coral Microbiome Project, we want this to be an asset for the field as a whole. So we've, we're putting a lot of effort into making our data publicly accessible as quickly as possible. So this is a video that, uh, or sorry, this is a, Oh no, that didn't work. This is a map that uh, Ryan McMines has put together. If it'll work, which it might not. Let me click it. There we go. Where you can see, uh, you, you can access, access this on that link right now. This will show you every, every coral that we've sampled. You can zoom in. You can look at photos of each individual coral, get some idea of metadata. 
We're going to be putting up as quickly as possible our microbiome data. This isn't up at the moment, but as we get it, we're going to be posting it publicly so that people can start to use this as an asset for their own research, as well as potentially for outreach uh, and science communication. I'd like to end by acknowledging all of the people that are involved in this project. It's a huge project. Uh, and I'd mostly like to thank you guys for coming along to hear me talk. I'm, I'm